welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. I'm Manoj Keval Ramani and today I have with me my colleague King Shuk Saha to talk about Japan's view of the Indo-Pacific and Japan's view of its own national security. This conversation is coming in the context of Japan's new national security strategy which was released in December last year. Following the release of that strategy, you saw the Japanese Prime Minister visiting Washington DC after which a lengthy joint statement was issued and what we've seen over the last couple of years is that increasingly Japan's foreign policy has become much more action oriented much more security focused and it seems to be shedding its baggage after the second world war and it seems to be adopting a much more proactive strategy to deal with the challenges that the rise of China and the diffusion of power in the international order today presents so king shuk welcome to this conversation thank you manu so king shuk first from what i understand japan's first national security strategy was issued in 2013 so it's something that it's fairly new in that system uh, and i only make that point because in the indian system we've been having this conversation about the need for a new national security strategy so i just wanted to begin by asking you is it a regular exercise now in japan that do you see the national security strategy and why is the need to issue a document like this? This. Yeah. So, if you see the current global environment, firstly, coming to your question, is not a regular thing. The last time it was issued on, as you rightly pointed out, 2013, and after a decade, it had been published in 2020. So, it had been a fairly a long time. And in between, as you said, Japan, you know, they come up with white paper, defense white paper. But the reason for coming of a new national strategy is like if you look at Japan context, it is being one of the key countries in Northeast Asia where Japan has lot of its turbulent neighbor, be it China, be it North Korea, also Russia. So in this increasingly changing geopolitical situation, Japan is feeling increasingly threatened. So this is one of the reason why it has come up with new security strategy. I think that partly, you know, and again in India we see this debate about why do you need to put out such a document? There is clarity on what needs to be done. Is a document going to help or hinder? For whom are you issuing such a document? Is it for your own system? Is it for signaling to the external world? I think, like you said, that there is a certain value in. actually underscoring and outlining what are your key challenges and why is it that your national security system is being used for what it's being used what is what are the threats that it should be geared for what are the threats that it is facing and what are the anticipated threats in the future and what are your strengths and therefore how do you mobilize that entire machinery so it's a useful exercise in thinking through all these challenges so that you can optimize so that any state can optimize its resources and options again putting it in the public domain is another question you know that's a lot of that has to do in different countries with legal requirements or with say how systems operate right some systems operate with greater transparency with greater need for openness others don't necessarily feel that they need to do that and others do that in different ways like you said in Japan you have the defense white papers but it's a useful exercise to actually think through all of these things and to sort of outline them clearly because it really helps even the external world to understand and across the bureaucracies in those countries to understand why is it that you're doing what you're doing okay so with that said i want to sort of read out a little bit from the strategy document and then i want to ask you why is it that japan feels this way so when i was going through it it says that japan's security environment is and i quote severe and complex as it has ever been since the end of world war 2 what has so fundamentally changed in japan's internal security environment that it feels that it has become severe and complex as it has ever been since the end of the second world war so post world war as we know japan become as pacifist country so whereby it had even in its constitution it re- renounce its sovereign right of war so under the macarthur constitution that was framed in japan post second world war the renounce war but during all this phase there was a cold war even after that the brief lull of peace now if you see the present global context the world is changing very rapidly and from if you see from japan context the rise of china and the rise of china in the sense it is becoming in more and more belligerent japan is feeling increasingly threatened and if you look at as i already said in the neighborhood japan has a long history of unease with its some of the key neighbor be it china be it north korea and russia so in this context like with 
North Korea Japan doesn't have diplomatic relation but North Korea continues to provoke Japan with his frequent missile testings sometime coming into Japanese waters also China is coming more and more assertive in South China Sea and East China Sea yeah dispute over Senkaku Island is increasing while with Russia like Japan has issue with the northern territories and the recent like the Russia's attack on Ukraine had been one of the trigger point so all this had pushed Japan to a corner that made it revisit its policy till now what it was following and also in this context like USA is not what it used to be like it it is not ready to be the global police man in the world hmm. so all this reason had made it more for Japan to stand on its feet and have a more proactive policy to defend its territory. It's really interesting that there has been this intensive... Firstly, I think Japan's reaction to the war in Ukraine has been extremely interesting, right? They've been quite upfront and quite critical of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, and in fact, this national security strategy, again, I, to me, it was really interesting that it was so clearly spelled out in some ways that they say specifically, and I quote, Russia's aggression against Ukraine has easily reached the very foundation of the rules that shape the international order. The possibility cannot be precluded that a similar serious situation may arise in the future in the Indo-Pacific region, especially East Asia. To me, that bit... Uh, is really interesting that they are essentially linking what's happened between Russia and Ukraine to the current situation in the Indo-Pacific. And obviously, I don't think that they are hinting at Russia being the belligerent in the Indo-Pacific region. I think the indication is towards China. Although that said, Japan and Russia do also have a territorial dispute surrounding the Kuril Islands. And there have been some sort of tensions with regard to fishing, with regard to claims being made. And there was a period of time where you could have probably expected a, a settlement to the dispute. But today, uh, this is like sort of far from that, right? So we're seeing an intensification where Japan does feel cornered with China on one side and with Russia, both having long-standing disputes with Japan and both conducting naval drills, which can seem extremely threatening from a Japanese point of view. So it's not that Japan is just looking at what's happening in East Asia, what's happening in the in Eastern Europe and saying, you know, and taking a value-based stance. It's also a very realist interest-based stance based on its own sense of security being threatened because of not just the rise of China, but also the proximity between China and Russia. And I think that is something that, you know, people tend to overlook because people, we tend to over, we, people tend to see Japan as essentially a US ally falling in line with American policy. But this is quite in line with also Japanese interests. Uh, and the one sort of thing that I will add is that another area where Japan has become much more forceful in its public statements is around the issue of Taiwan. Over the last few years, there have been quite straightforward statements. I think Japan has not shied away from annoying Beijing, where it's specifically spoken about the challenge of the situation around Taiwan, about the possibility of tensions leading to something worse, while also sort of talking about, you know, its conventional policy on Taiwan. So like as like we just talked about, right, that uh, Kishida met Biden in January and from their joint statement, again, I can read out a line on Taiwan. We emphasize our basic positions on Taiwan remain unchanged and reiterate the importance of maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan state as an indispensable element of security and prosperity in the international community. I think it's really important that this constantly does get mentioned by the Japanese and the only reason that I'm highlighting this is because from an Indian point of view, whenever there is quad meeting, India tends to shy away from references to Taiwan. But okay, so this is Japan's security environment. What are the kind of objectives that it wishes to pursue? What are its interests? How does it seek to... Obviously, maintaining security and sovereignty will probably be the primary interest, given that we've already spoken about that. But what else beyond that? Japan is seeing it now in a multi-dimensional way. So firstly, it would be like diplomatic outreach. So it will engage with the more countries. Secondly, like as you rightly pointed out, we have seen increase in defense, like it is building up a defense budget had been increased in the next five years. The outlay would be around 2% of the budget that comes roughly around 320 billion, whereby they will modernize their self-defense force. Is that defense outlay being increased significantly over the last few years or is it around the same level that it has been in terms of percentage of GDP? It is increasing. Like in this year, if you say like in 2023, they had been increased by around 26%. Oh, okay. That's so, significant. Yeah. So now in 2023, it would be around 51 billion roughly. So and over the next five years, like so their target would be around 2% of Japan's GDP. Okay. So that will be around $350 billion, as I've said, and whereby it will make Japan the third largest 
defense spender in the world after US and China. So they will be investing a lot on... That's a significant change from yeah. being a pacifist country to now becoming one of the biggest spenders on defense. Yeah, the reason for this would be like they want to have a second strike capability. As we have pointed out, they are a pacifist country, so Japan won't attack any country. But in case someone attacks this or wants to attack, as you said rightly before, like signaling is also one of the important posture. So whereby Japan wants to increase its defense force in such a way... So, be it China or North Korea will think before attacking. Huh. So, it is investing in long-range missiles, like the Tomahawk missile. It is increasing its self-defense naval force, frigates and nuclear submarine. It is buying next-generation fighter aircraft in collaboration with United Kingdom and Italy. Huh. So, these are some of the things. Also, Japan will engage more unilaterally. Huh. So, Japan is one of the largest, like, producer of aids to different countries, their ODA, that is, of Overs uh, overseas... Outward Development Assistance, yes. Outward Development Assistance. So, whereby they want to engage with the developing countries and the global south. So, these are some of the things, like, which Japan's plan to do. That's fascinating. I mean, firstly, expansion of the defense budget just tells you that there is a willingness to put behind, put sort of your dollars behind your threat perceptions. And we'll sort of link to the defense strategy in the show notes and... It's really important for people to go through at least some of the detailing of what sort of uh, challenges are outlined in the security environment, starting with this Indo-Pacific region to China to North Korea that King should talked about, uh, and also uh, a detailing of the objectives and the main components that King should pointed out, starting with diplomatic capabilities to defense capabilities. And it just, I think it begs a question, given that you know, I, I presume that by the time this podcast goes on air, either our budget, the Indian annual budget would have been announced or would probably be in the process of being announced. Given that, the conversation around defense spending in India uh, and the need to spend more on capital acquisition, this is an, an example of a country basically saying that, look, um, our threat perceptions are increasing. Therefore, we need to spend much more on defense. And I think it's something for Indian, for the Indian establishment also to think about. And while you said that the objective of the Japanese government seems to be to achieve a 2% spending, 2% of GDP spending on defense, that figure is sort of your NATO benchmark. But it's not a sacrosanct figure. It's not something that is definitive. If your security environment is intensely poor, you can obviously spend much more. Now, given the fact that India has tremendous other challenges also, it's never obviously going to be an easy choice, but it's something worth thinking about, given the fact that our defense, so much of our defense budget is now going on manpower expenses that we're sort of eating into capital expenditure. It might be worth thinking the fact that, uh, you know, how are other countries responding to what seem to be significant changes in the world order? And I think the Japanese example is something for India to think through. I also like the fact that within the document, uh, when they talk about comprehensive national power of Japan. They talk about technological capabilities and they talk about intelligence capabilities. Again, something that from an Indian point of view is something that we need to take away. My sort of final set of questions to you around is, um, does the document say anything around Japan's partnership with India? And if it doesn't say, if it does, what kind of partners that it, that it talks about that it wants to work with? And if there is anything around India firstly, and then we can go forward. In document, like India is one of the key partners for Japan in Indo-Pacific. Even they have mentioned this. Apart from this, I will just give you a background. So, since 2006, India is a key and strategic partner of Japan since the visit of Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. So, when in 2014, when uh, Prime Minister Modi went there, it was upgraded to special strategic and global partnership. Japan and India, they are key partners on their own right and being part of the Quad made them even closer and economically both countries, the relation is become deeper and deeper. Japan is one of the key investor, one of the key foreign direct investor in India. It is the fifth largest FDA investor in India and India is the largest recipient of Japan's aid. Apart from this, like there's a great synergy between these two countries. If you like see the shared history, India and Japan share from the 6th century BC and the current scenario, like both are being challenged by the belligerent rise of China. Yeah. And if you look, that is the uh, security wise. And if you see our economy of the both countries, it is complementary. Japan is technologically very rich. Economically, they have 
they are developed country while well, india is developing so india provide lot of opportunities for japan for investment moreover with japan's declining population india skill manpower provide them a great opportunity for their industries for their tech sector to work so like in that way well, both countries form a there is a great partnership and so overall like when you talk about national strategy security all this you have to see the holistic picture you yeah. have to take into economy you have to take the defense and whereby in all on all these parameters india and japan like complement each other yeah I, i think there are a couple of other sort of interesting things within the document that are worth highlighting but before i go back to the national security strategy there have been reports about how japan is working much more closely with the united states in order to de- deter china and much of this has become much more about forward posturing also uh, there was a piece in the financial times a couple of weeks ago in which you had a us commander talking about the nature of deployment and we'll try and link that in the show notes too um but just going back to you know in in january earlier january we had um, a 2 plus 2 dialogue between the us and japan uh, and again there was an interesting paragraph in that uh, joint statement that was issued after the 2 plus 2 which just tells you about how nature of the partnership is no longer about collective defense it's also about being prepared for conflict for example when i quote from the 2 plus 2 joint statement the united states expressed its determination to optimize its force posture in the indo pacific including in japan by forward deploying more versatile resilient and mobile capabilities japan supported the us plan to optimize its force posture and welcomed its strong commitment to maintain a robust presence in the region i think this is really significant because it's a basically telling us what that financial times report started to tell us uh, in much more detail about how there is much more forward deployment and there is preparation in case of conflict and this is obviously preparation in the context of whether you know if hostilities were to break out so there is forward deployment preparation to be made early on this was not happening before so this tells you about the shifting nature of of force posture within you know the east asian region uh, given that tensions have been extremely high around taiwan of late and i think this is uh, one sort of important point to take away the other uh, really valuable sort of thing that i sort of took away from this document was around uh, the use the strategic use of uh, oda and the focus on defense t- technology transfer um japan talks about its outward development assistance as something that it needs to use strategic manner to promote uh, connectivity to promote human resource development maritime security rule of law infrastructure and economic activity and it sort of talks about this in the context of human security but again this is really really important given that we've talked about bri and so many other things and japan has been a big player in the indian ocean region and the indo pacific when it comes to financial assistance and it sees that as a key part of the its free and open indo pacific strategy so it's important if india and japan can actually work together uh, on this much more closely to try and deliver outcomes and again on defense trans technology transfer it's one of those really tricky things which doesn't really happen and you know no country wants to transfer defense technology in particular but it's heartening to see that the document quite clearly talks about the fact that um transfer of defense equipment and technology overseas is a key policy instrument to ensure peace and stability especially in the indo-pacific region to deter challenges to the status quo by force and to create a desirable security environment for japan i think that this is something that from an indian point of view is valuable to keep in mind that if this is the opportunity space that is that the world is today presenting us and western partners and allies are presenting us then this is a moment for us to actually leverage these opportunities that exist with that kingchuk i any last thoughts on what can we expect from japanese policy over the year i think japan would become more like as you said proactive something that was lacking especially in their defense domain as they in building up their capability to in near future we can see more japanese engagement outside of japan and as being part of quad so i think the whole indo pacific region will see greater japanese activities also like as you said they are one of the key players in development fund so and also you mentioned the context of bri that is also very important as we all have it is for all have seen that how china they trap this trapping all the countries and it is a matter of concern for us if you look at our immediate neighborhood what happened to sri lanka and pakistan is on the verge of bankruptcy so this hold a great lesson for us in this india and japan can work together as india is a leader of global south like in india has so many years of experience in working in close coordination with the countries of global south and 
with Japan, like together, they can prove another alternative, another way for this country to develop without without being falling trapped in the debt trap. And also, like the more increasing robust cooperation between India and Japan, I think will good not only for both the countries but for region as whole. Yeah. Because the greater expectation for US to carry all the load, I think those days are gone. Yeah. Like each has to see their own. Yeah. So uh, like this. Yeah. Yeah. Like like when there was this recent uh, lecture by Bilahari Kausikan, uh, former Singaporean diplomat, who talked about the fact that the US is going to remain an offshore rebalancer and other countries will have to pick up the slack. And that is a fact of life, whether it is a Democrat in the White House or a Republican in the White House. And this strategy that the Japanese have released seems to suggest that they are they have a sense of what that challenge is before them. And they're also committing greater money behind that. Uh, with that, thank you so much, King Shuk, for this conversation. Uh, and we'll try and link all the articles along with the national security strategy in the show notes for folks who are interested. If you'd like to get in touch with us, please do write to us in response to this podcast or go to our website, website www.takshashila.org.in. You can find all our research over there, information about our courses and the other fun things that we publish, including a lot of free newsletters if you're interested. Thank you so much for listening to us. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashila.inst or our website takshashila.org.in